It's less rational. It's so much harder to uh, to put your finger on how to succeed. There's so uh, many fewer projects being made as part of it. It's more competitive. It's ultimately disorienting and kind of scary. And so for me, my career has gone back and forth between TV and features. And this uh, evening, I'll pick up on basically, again, going from King of the Hill into feature rewriting and then back into TV when Greg Daniels uh, invited me to be a part of the staff of The Office, a show on NBC with Steve Carell. So let me start by talking about The Office, trying to tell you why I think that show worked, uh, and uh, expose you to Greg Daniels' story-creating process, which is really unique in TV and maybe uh, qualifies him as one of the great story creators ever. Um, then I'll walk you through one story that I wrote so we can kind of look at what made it work. Um, and then part two I will talk about Judd Apatow. And Apatow is the guy I've been working with most recently. I'm just coming off of running a show for him on Netflix called Love. And so part two we'll do lessons of Apatow. I'll walk you through Judd's uh, bio and where he learned what he learned, and then try to share with you what I've learned from working with him. Uh, okay, so let's start with The Office. So uh, in 2007, I got a call from uh, Greg Daniels inviting me to join his show, The Office, which had been on uh, the air for a season and a half. They'd done a short season and then a full season. And it was, at this point, not yet a ratings hit, and it never was, believe it or not. It was always a little bit on the bubble for NBC. Um, but it had tremendous critical acclaim already within a season and a half. In, in fact, many tastemakers in comedy believed it to be the best show on TV with good reason. Uh, and its star, Steve Carell, had just been in a movie, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, making him a movie star and ensuring that the show would then stay on the air because it had that increased drawing power. So I was brought in when the show was already, in a sense, created. And uh, the this, this show had a good staff. If you look at the writing staff of this show, almost every one of those writers went on to be something of a hotshot. Um, writers included Mike Schur. He was a junior writer on that show. He went on to create Parks and Rec. Uh, another writer was Mindy Kaling. Her first job in television, she was an unknown uh, comedian performer with a very interesting voice. She was put on the staff. She's now a famous uh, uh, performer, writer, with good reason. So the staff was full of uh, talented but green writers. And then there was Greg, uh, Paul Lieberstein, who played Toby. Uh, who was a veteran writer, and a writer named Jen Salata, who was a, a veteran writer from Malcolm in the Middle. But you can see, as on most TV shows, what you have is a preponderance of writers who are completely inexperienced, though very talented, um, a couple of veterans at the top, and it's the veterans really who have to come in right from the start and create a hit show, because they're the only ones who really know how to do it. The great veteran in this case is Greg Daniels, and I think that a huge amount of the credit for why the show works goes to Greg. But let's start with what Greg saw in the British office, which was what he based it on. So many of you know that the American office was based on a show created by Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant called The Office, uh, starring uh, Ricky Gervais. The thing about this show, the number one thing about it that really caught people's attention who like comedy, it's a word I've used in here before and I'll use it again. The word is naturalism. The style of comedy was different, if you look at it, from, from any comedy on TV. Naturalism essentially evaporated from uh, television comedy entirely, uh, if it had ever been there. I think that the, the great uh, maker of realistic, naturalistic comedy before The Office really is Jim Brooks with shows like Taxi, Mary Tyler Moore, uh, etc. They had a, a at least a, an aspiration towards naturalistic uh, behavior. The other one I guess in between would be the Larry Sanders show, which is the one that uh, people who really like naturalistic comedy like Apatow and Greg Daniels always point to uh, as, as the one that had the tone that they like. So Greg, who had done King of the Hill, had a development deal at NBC, 
they show him this this British uh, comedy, and he completely flips over and thinks this is the greatest thing ever. I will do an American show based on this. Greg took that pilot, the British pilot for the British office, and was told by NBC, go reinvent it, Greg. Make this an American show. Use this as an inspiration. Do whatever you want. Make new characters. Redo the dialogue. Punch it up. Put in new backstories. Whatever you want. He did that. He invented new characters. He deconstructed it. He wrote new plots. He reconstructed it. He went back. The pilot that he shot finally is verbatim the British pilot with American accents. When he deconstructed it, he found that it was so well put together that he ultimately didn't want to change anything. And it, it's almost word for word the British pilot with different names. Uh, and it worked for the comedy fans for sure. It did not work for a broad audience sufficiently. It did not get good enough ratings for NBC to say, we're into this. And after one and a half seasons, in fact, uh, NBC sat Greg down and said, this show will not go on. It cannot go on. No show in America has ever been a hit with this tone. And what specifically they meant is this. In British comedy, there is a tolerance for what you might call the anti-hero. So it's the star who's very funny, but is ultimately not a good, warm, lovable person. It's fun to laugh at uh, exaggerated sort of villainous characters, and that's what Ricky Gervais as uh, uh, Michael Brent, uh, is his character? Brent. What is it? Brent. David Brent. David Brent. David Brent is not a likable guy. He's a really kind of a foul person. Uh, and that's what Steve Carell was taking his cues off of, and it was really funny. But NBC said, the show will not go on this way. You must change the character. And if you watch the American office, it changes quite perceptibly from season one and a half to season, what was officially season three, the beginning of season three. They just warmed him up. And it was one of the great pivots ever in TV because... It was, it was perceptible if you're, if you're watching for it, but still within the logic of the character. Essentially what they did was they made Steve Carell's character, though still a jackass, still kind of an idiot, they made him really love the characters in the office, the people that he worked with. He loved them profoundly as if they were his family. And that subtext of family is, in fact, the great common denominator of every successful comedy ever. If you go out and try to create a television show, take nothing but that, and you will be sitting on the great gold nugget of what makes successful comedies. Subtext of family. Even in a workplace show, subtext of family. And once they made that change, the ratings picked up, and there was a sense the show could go on, which it did for nine seasons. So, uh, so what makes the show successful, in great part, it's based on a, on a solidly built comedy uh, with a naturalistic tone that comedy fans were ready for. Uh, it is definitely built around that one thing that you must have in any show, which is a main character. So we know for sure to have a hit, you've got to have a hit character, and Michael Scott, played by Steve Carell, is that character. So, you know, a lot of times standing up in front of you here, I have said character above everything, character above premise, and yet what makes for a good character. So thinking I would come talk to you, I tried to analyze what made Michael Scott a good character. To me, the thing that's most evident immediately are the contradictions within the character, the contradiction between the way he perceives himself and the way he's actually coming across, which is a fundamental way of building a comic character. Uh, he thinks he's funny. He really thinks he's a very witty, funny, entertaining guy, yet his jokes are terrible, he's really kind of a buffoon. That contradiction alone powers a lot of who he is. Uh, he thinks he's attractive and charming when in fact he's kind of repugnant. He thinks he's helpful to people when in fact he's really kind of a disaster for them. So he's got these contradictions built into him. Uh, last week, I happened to run into Paul Lieberstein who played Toby on the show and ran uh, the office for many years. And I said to Paul, what, what made Steve a, a great character? He had a totally different definition of what made uh, him a great character that I think is so valuable when looking at what makes a character. Paul said what made Michael Scott a great character was he had an unfulfillable need that generated stories. Michael Scott's unfulfillable need was a need to be loved by all the people in his office. 
He could never get that. No boss really can be loved by his employees the way Michael Scott needed to be. And note that this need endlessly generated stories because Michael Scott really couldn't have an interaction with anyone in his office without that need coming into play. If he so much as had a meeting with the other characters in the office, it would be a meeting in which he had this agenda to get their approval and win them over. So there was always this powerful story drive and comic drive coming from Michael Scott, the character himself. And you can really see how essential this is for the construction of a TV show when Michael Scott, Steve Carell, leaves the show in season seven. Carell had a seven year contract and at the end of it he felt he'd done everything he could on the show. He loved the show but he was done and wanted to go on to bigger things. So after season seven he leaves and the show becomes very difficult to do without him, almost impossible in fact. We had at one point promoted Ed Helms, uh, the character of Andy Bernard, to be the uh, boss of the office. We thought, well this would be great, you know, Helms is a funny character, Corell was a funny character, uh, surely everything will run as smoothly. But it didn't because the need of Andy Bernard was totally different. He was, uh, he was never going to push people around. He was never going to uh, manipulate the other characters the way Michael Scott would, and so he just couldn't generate stories. And it was, it was something that nobody anticipated, but everybody had to deal with at that juncture in the show. So there's a great lesson there. As you look at the show, uh, the show is a great example of shedding its premise successfully, fairly quickly. So the premise, you know, we talk about uh, selling shows, and frequently the premise of a show is its selling tool. So what would a premise be? A premise would be for 24, you say we're going to do a show, and, and part of the premise is that every hour of the show is actually a real-time hour in that person's life. That's an original premise, right? Um, you know, anything can be a premise. Uh, uh, a guy uh, gets divorced and moves back in with his parents. You know, that's a very common sitcom premise. And we can get attracted by original premises, and they are valuable when selling shows. But a show must shed its premise. In this case, The Office. The premise really is, it's a documentary about uh, an American workplace. And so no one had done a comedy that was actually a mockumentary. That's what The British Office was as well. And that really was the original thing that was added to the show. But in fact, it sheds that pretty quickly. Uh, the documentary element kind of disappears uh, very early on. And so what does it become? It really becomes about the characters. Uh, so starting with Michael Scott, you have a very strong character. But just as you watch yourself go down the line of the characters, you can see how well built the show is. Uh, number two on the call sheet is Dwight Rain Wilson. Another very solid character. Uh, intrinsically funny for a number of reasons. One of them is that he's a guy who is extremely loyal and worships the great man of Michael Scott. So just the fact of worshiping a guy who's a buffoon is intrinsically funny in itself. Uh, I think another element to Dwight was that he was what you would perceive as a low status character. He's basically kind of a nerd, right? He dresses funny, his haircut is funny, he's not cool in any perceivable way, but his self-esteem is incredibly high. And so when you have a low st status character with high self-esteem, there's something in intrinsically joyful about that. I asked uh, Rain about his character at one point. I said, you know, you never seem to be making fun of this character. You seem to be really delighting in him all the time. And Rain said, yes. He said, it's essential as a performer never to judge your characters. That was the way he put it. He had no criticism of this guy. He just played it as three-dimensionally as he could, and it came across in the joyful energy of the character. I find that this element of, of not judging your character, loving your character. Sam Simon, one of the creators of The Simpsons, uh, who died recently, was asked nearly on his deathbed what the great secret of comedy was to him, and he said it was to love your characters. So it's something to really try to embrace. Uh, Paul Rust, the star of our show Love on Netflix, he uh, had a similar transformation this season where he felt that in the pilot episode he had not fully delivered the character the way he was delivering it in later episodes. And again, the reason was 
Paul said that he was playing in the pilot with a certain critical distance and a certain sort of criticizing the character as he was playing it. And as the season went on, he developed this comfort and joy and acceptance of the character, a certain love of character that transformed the character in his performance. So it's something you can bring to the creation of your characters as well. Ask yourself, especially when you're doing a comedy, are you dogging on the character too much, or do you at some level love this character? If you love the character, you're probably on more solid ground. All right, further characters on The Office. You have Jim and Pam. Jim is a very well-created character. He's essentially a dramatic character. He is the leading man of the show, and he's the point-of-view character of the show. If something interesting happens on The Office, Jim is the point-of-view character. What does that mean? It means that he's the character who is closest to the point of view of the audience itself. The opinions that Jim is having are the opinions that you, the viewer, are meant to have. When Dwight does something ridiculous, Jim will literally look at camera and kind of give it a look. He's the only character who consistently looks directly into camera, making contact with you, the viewer, and sharing a moment of like, Jesus, can you believe this is happening? So he's, he's just overtly the point of view character. But he's not the central character. For sure, Michael Scott is the central character. I can tell you that uh, without any equivocation because as we would try to break stories on The Office, we would ask ourselves, what is the A story, what is the B story, what is the C story? Always, Michael was the A story. There was never an exception. He was the central character. He was the most interesting character, the most powerful character, but he wasn't the point of view character. Uh, so I think it's an interesting distinction to realize that the central character and the point of view character can be different. Jim, um, strengths of this character, he uh, is a kind of self-evidently attractive character. And as a person, John Krasinski is an attractive guy. You know, he's just, he's charming, he's likable. It makes perfect sense to you that women like him. But if you look at him, he's not classically handsome, which I think is pretty cool. He's got kind of odd, you know, his nose is a little too big, his ears are kind of large. He's a gangly guy who is just not movie star handsome at all. And the fact that it really is his personality and his character which um, take him over the edge to being an attractive central guy, I think, is, is part of what makes him so special as a performer. He um, is in a relationship, obviously, with Pam, and the Jim-Pam element of this show was one of the reasons it, it garnered such a, a fan base. If you look at Pam, played by Jenna Fisher, she also has some distinct strengths as a character. When we meet Pam, she is uh, a working class uh, secretary who is engaged to be married to a guy named Roy who's kind of a big lout. And the, the central point that you're being shown is that uh, Pam doesn't value herself high enough. She's with a guy who just who doesn't see how great she is. He's kind of a beer drinking, a little bit dumb, uh, calls her babe, doesn't take any interest in her artistic aspirations, and yet she's with him, which suggests that she devalues herself. And there's something very relatable about that, to see a character who, uh, who doesn't realize how wonderful she is, and is secretly loved by the most wonderful guy on the show. There's something very emotionally powerful and compelling about that, to see Pam not realize how beloved she is by somebody other than her actual fiancé. And that was an engine really driving the emotional appeal of the show. Okay, so if ever you create a show in which you have a romance at the center of it, or write a story that has romance at the center of it, something that you will come up against is how do you keep two characters who are self-evidently meant to be together, that you are rooting to be together because they belong together, why don't they just get together? Well, if they did, that would be the end of your series. So you must contrive reasons why they don't get together. And the history of uh, the romance genre is the history of people coming up with reasons why the characters can't get together. You think of Romeo and Juliet, well, their parents are warring enemies and they can't possibly even speak to each other, let alone uh, be together. That's a great obstacle and makes for a great romance. Uh, it's quite instructive to look at the way the office managed to play out an obstacle for years and years, because that's the great challenge. 
So initially, the obstacle is Pam is engaged to another man, and she is going forward with the marriage. Even though we see that it's wrong for her, she is committed to uh, marrying this guy, and so that obstacle is 100%. And so although Jim loves her, and although there's rapport between them, they can never get together. And one whole season was played out just with that, of the longing and the looks and the wonderful rapport that, that uh, bubbles up and then is interrupted by the arrival of the fiancé. And that formula played over and over again the entire first season. The character of Dwight, interestingly, fits in very nicely to their romance because Dwight, uh, teasing Dwight and pranking Dwight actually becomes a form of flirtation between these two characters. So it's a form of comedy, comic interaction between Jim and Dwight, but it plays on a deeper level because it's the way that Pam and Jim are connecting emotionally. So that goes on for one full season, at the end of which uh, there's an episode called Casino Night in which Jim declares his love to Pam. He can't hold it back anymore, and he tells her that he's crazy about her, and he kisses her. And that's the season finale of season 1.5. And a, you know, a lovely cliffhanger for people who were following that show, uh, or that element of the show, it was a huge amount of, of build-up and repressed emotion, and then it all comes out at once, and then the season's over. And it, it brought fans back for the next season. The question now is, what is the obstacle? Well, the obstacle now becomes uh, Pam struggling. Uh, will she recognize that Jim is the right guy to be with? Will she have the courage to leave the engagement that she's in? Very cleverly, the uh, writing staff plotted it out in the following way. Pam waits too long to recognize the reality of her emotions for Jim, and Jim, heartbroken that he's poured out his love for her and hasn't uh, had her reciprocate, accepts a transfer from the office that he works in to another office branch in uh, Stanford, uh, another uh, town, you know, many uh, miles away. And so now they have this geographical distance, and it seems like uh, we we have a solid obstacle again. Uh, we played that out for half a season of Jim in another office, during which he, uh, on the rebound gets involved with another woman. Then those two branches merge, so everybody comes back together again in the office, but Jim comes back now with Pam ready to leave her fiance, but Jim is now involved in another relationship. And so that becomes the obstacle for the rest of a season. Uh, and so, you know, now two and a half years have been, uh, have been played out without these two having to get together. And, uh, you know, Eventually, we had to uh, bring the two uh, together, but even that was stepped out nicely, I thought. There was a big proposal episode, then there was a big wedding episode. Um, sure enough, as predicted, once the two got married, the drama really was over between Jim and Pam. It was very difficult ever to do drama between them again. We did a little bit with her getting pregnant unexpectedly and having a baby, but for the most part, what you'll find if you ever do a romance uh, subplot or a story that, that centers around a romantic couple is once the couple gets together and certainly once they get married, your dramas then have to be Jim Dwight, Pam Michael, Jim Creed, Pam Stanley. You essentially have to break them up and make their dramas be with other people. Uh, the exception to that was the final season of the show where we experimented with something that seemed on paper like it should work wonderfully. And that was, uh, what happens if this couple that have been now living together happily for some time, we put enormous stress on them to the point where they actually break up. So Jim and Pam, we were going to have them get completely separated uh, and uh, divorced within the final season. And then the final episode of The Office, it was always planned that uh, it would be a reunion episode so that the documentary that these people have been in airs. And when it airs, um, then a year passes and they have a reunion episode of the characters. The idea was, okay, so it'll be a reunion episode and this will be the episode in which Jim and Pam reunite. And so it will be a double reunion and seemed very clever and, and satisfying to us on paper. What we discovered was, uh, as we tried to break Jim and Pam up, the 
audience hated it so much <laughs> that we had to abandon it. Uh, the feedback online came back that it was just excruciating for the people who had invested so much in this relationship. They didn't enjoy it. They didn't enjoy it on a level of drama. They didn't enjoy it on a level of comedy. They didn't, uh, they didn't uh, trust that it was going to work out okay. And so finally, if you watch season nine, you'll see that these two are on the verge of breaking up. And then in the next episode, they're like, man, I'm sure glad we got through that. That was great. <laughs> we did some couples counseling, and everything's a-okay with us. And then we just did the last four episodes of them completely being happy together. So it was a, it was a complete pivot uh, that came from the uh, audience feedback. So there you have the, the top four characters on the call sheet. Uh, Michael, Dwight, Jim, Pam, that account for probably the bulk of the success of that show. But not to be discounted is a very deep bench of characters. So just take a look at some of the other clever things that are done character-wise on the show. You have uh, Phyllis and Stanley. Phyllis, uh, if you know the show, kind of a frumpy um, middle-aged woman, uh, she was the casting director's assistant. And uh, when Greg Daniels was doing casting, he would, he would be looking at the actors on screen and he would hear the voice off screen of a woman reading lines with them. And finally he said, who is this woman? Can you just turn the camera around so I can see her? And, uh, and he loved the, the realism of her. The, this tone of naturalism was greatly enhanced by the... Uh, surrounding characters that Greg cast and Phyllis is a great example she really feels very real she's not a trained actress and it comes across in her performance style which is a little quirky very minimalist kind of subdued she's there's no polish there she feels very real um, Stanley uh, a, a, a wonderful actor who uh, it's an example of a guy who who could play one note very well that kind of subtle, grumpy, pissed off guy. In reality, he is exactly the opposite. You could not find a more sort of um, uh, flamboyant, sort of traipsing around guy. Um, uh, what's interesting, when you have a character like that who is so different from his or her, uh, when the character is so different from the actual actor's biography, typically what you find is those actors have a have a limited range they have trouble improvising and typically with you know the joke that would go around with uh, with Stanley was uh, you would say uh, uh, you know uh, uh, okay Leslie can you deliver your line you'd say what time is it and you would say okay now do it really angry what time is it okay now do it really scared what time is it now do it in a whisper what time is it now shout at the top of your lungs what time is it and, okay we got it uh, Leslie perfect then he'd be like ooh I want donuts and then he would sort of mince off to the, to the craft services table as a completely different guy uh, but for the show he contributed uh, a, a realism also I think he's a very minimalist actor a very internal actor and those minimalist internal performers help populate that office in a way that made it feel realistic and naturalistic. The, if you look at the characters, you'll find that it's constructed nicely in pairings. Phyllis and Stanley. Phyllis and Stanley had a kind of uh, grumpy, they were really like a married couple that were bickering all the time. Um, but they had a distinct rapport to them. And they were in their own desk clump. You had a desk clump with Oscar, Angela, and Kevin. A very cleverly constructed desk clump because you have Oscar who is uh, a uh, gay Puerto Rican guy, and you have uh, Angela, who's a conservative uh, Christian, and so there was always friction just on a kind of political level with the two of them. But in addition, you had Kevin, who was a big kind of sports-loving slob, and so he contrasted with them in the sense that they were both kind of prim and proper, and so that it was a pair contrasting with a single guy, and then within the pair, the two contrasting. It's a very well-constructed group there. You had also uh, uh, Meredith, uh, who, <coughs> Meredith is an example when you're creating characters for actors. Uh, Meredith was a very difficult character for the writers early on. The writers felt that it was difficult to write a uh, comedy that she delivered well. Uh, you always want uh, to write a line and then the actor delivers it and they bring the line up to some degree. Where you say, that line was like a B and, and Rain Wilson delivered and it just became an A+. 
Steve Carell would always A plus your lives. Uh, Dwight similarly. True of most of the actors, but Meredith was considered to turn your your B plus into a C minus, and she was despised by the writers for this reason. But in fact, it was the writers who were writing her wrong. And there was one season where I actually really believed in the actress Kate Flannery, and I thought that she was getting a raw deal from the writers. And I had an episode in which she featured prominently and just talked to her about her life. It turns out she's the daughter of an Irish uh, barkeeper, and her, her wheelhouse was just filthy, body, in your face, shameless uh, uh, lines. And as soon as you gave her that, she would score all day long. And so she literally went from the least popular character to write for to somebody everybody was happy to create stories for once they found the formula that matched the character to the performer. Other performers on the show, uh, Creed Bratton, uh, if you've seen the show, an incredibly popular character, one of the most popular characters on the show if you were to poll the audience. Uh, if you actually watch the show, he rarely has more than three lines in any show. Mm -hmm. And it's an example of the way when you have a very exaggerated, eccentric character, very little goes a long way. You would just remember his lines because they really stood out. Um, for what it's worth, Creed the uh, human being and performer is exactly Creed, the character, in the sense of being absolutely just off. I mean, he's a wonderful guy. He was a musician in a band called The Grassroots in the 60s. He seems to have fried his brain on all kinds of drugs. And now he's just a sweet dude who has no idea why what he's doing is funny. Um, he will propose improvs to you that make no sense and uh, has no idea why. <laughs> but, you know, you could lob him crazy stuff and he could deliver it credibly. Um, you know, rounding out the cast, you had um, uh, Kelly and Ryan, played by Mindy Kaling and B.J. Novak. Now, these were writers on the show, and Greg Daniels did something very unusual, which is he took two writers and he said, I'm going to make you cast members in a minor way. And his actual motive in this was to uh, teach the writers about the uh, acting process, to import uh, insights from the set into the writing uh, room, and to really integrate the writing and the performing. Uh, and it did work out that way to some significant degree. You'll notice if you watch the show that there's a main office where all the characters are, and then there's an annex. And in the annex is where you would find uh, Mindy and BJ, the reason being that if you had them in the main office, they'd have to be in the shots all the time, and then we would never have them in the writer's room. So we kept them in the annex, allowing them to be in the writer's room 95% of the time, and we would just pop them in a little bit for, um, for, for some performance. Uh, so there you have a look at the, the, uh, the way this cast was constructed. Uh, a couple other elements that are worth pointing out about what made the show successful. The mockumentary style, so you're basically doing a fake documentary here. Uh, it, it has some components to it which, which sneakily really help uh, this kind of comedy. One of them is as soon as you're in documentary, it increases the sense of realism. Documentaries have the connotation of realism, and so it, it pushes you towards a realistic style of performance and writing, which is very useful. But the other thing that it does, which I think very few people ever perceive, is that it creates a shooting style that is great for comedy. So just take a step back here uh, and, and, and talking about directing for a moment. We've talked about that before in here. Um, directing, as you guys go out and, and direct your own uh, shorts and try to make stuff, I highly encourage you to do it. Um, you know, the, the central uh, structure of directing any scene is get a master shot, which is a wide shot that shows you where you are, and then get coverage of the actors, meaning if there are two people talking, get a shot of this person talking and a shot of that person talking, typically over the shoulder, so it sort of shows us what our geography is. And that's the basic building blocks of all comedy. You know, you can go in tighter for, for face shots. You can move the camera for cinematic effect, but you can, in fact, shoot uh, comedy and drama all day long with just master and coverage. The, uh, the way you make a show look very beautiful is you light it uh, very in a very sophisticated way and what you typically do is you light one side of the room first 
and you film that character who's on that side of the room, and then you, quote, turn around, meaning you move all your lights and equipment and light this side and film this person. So you film the two people separately. The reason you do that typically in movie making and TV is because you want to light it beautifully, and you can't shoot both people simultaneously because you would see all the light stands sitting in the, in the shot. It's impossible to do. You have to shoot one way and then turn around. Not in mockumentary. In mockumentary, which is based on the shooting plan of a reality show, the way we shoot a reality show is you basically have some people standing around and you put, if there's a, some of us standing here, we put a camera kind of in that corner shooting this way, and another camera in that corner shooting this way. So we're always shooting two cameras simultaneously in a reality show and in a mockumentary. So this two camera simultaneous system of shooting is the way the office was shot. And it gives you one principal advantage in comedy, which can be essential. What it does is it allows actors to be highly improvisational. We can do a scene here as written. Now we can do a scene where I make up lines and the other person in the scene responds in all kinds of different ways. And every version of my improv that is matched with my partner's improv is captured by both cameras. Imagine what would happen if the camera was just on me and I did all my improvs and then we turn the camera around. We'd have to remember what all my improvs were, A, very difficult to do when you're in a quick shooting schedule, and B, the other actor would have to remember his or her responses. It's just not possible. It cannot be done. Uh, and it also takes twice as long to shoot this way and turn around so you have half as many takes and half as many opportunities for improv. So, if, like so many comedy creators today, you recognize that a tremendous advantage you have in making comedy is to hire talented performers who can improv, if you can get two cameras shooting simultaneously, you have a great advantage in improv comedy. Now, the office was always two cameras, so we were always able to improv. We were always able to get eight, 10, or even 12 takes compared to three, four, six takes in a traditional shooting schedule. So you can see the advantages uh, uh, that that brings. A guy like Judd Apatow in his movies has been so persuaded by the value of shooting two cameras simultaneously that when he shoots films, he shoots it that way anyway and lighting be damned. He just tries to get the lighting as good as he can and shoots what's called cross coverage constantly <coughs> and that's part of the style of a Judd Apatow show. Uh, okay, so those are some of the elements that, uh, that made the show good. The, the show, I would say, of, of all the shows I've ever worked on, and arguably, you know, the shows in the history of TV, uh, the story writing and story breaking process that Greg Daniels brought to this show was, had to be up there. Uh, it's certainly the most rigorous story breaking process that I've ever participated in. And I think it's really worth sharing with all of you who are uh, writers out there. So uh, Greg, Greg Daniels was a guy who uh, was Conan O'Brien's writing partner. They were friends at, uh, at Harvard. They came out of Harvard and were writers together. Uh, and Greg was a, just a unique uh, talent as a writer. I met him at The Simpsons. At The Simpsons, he was always a hotshot writer. But in addition to being very clever, he had started even on The Simpsons to fall for a style of writing even Simpsons which was more observational than the typical Simpsons episode. So a classic Greg Daniels episode is Bart Sells His Soul, which I've talked about in here. It's very observational. It was based on something that really happened to Greg, where at college a friend of his uh, who was an atheist uh, was talking to a religious uh, classmate and, and ridiculing the idea of, his, of a soul and, and said, I'll sell you my soul for $5 to a friend did it and then had this terrible crisis of conscience and worried and tried to buy the soul back. <laughs> and it's just a funny idea, right, that really happened. And Greg recognized that observations like that, when they're real and a bit funny, are a great jumping off point for stories and storytelling. So you could see his sensibility even then on The Simpsons. King of the Hill, he continues the sensibility. It's a very grounded, realistic show for the most part. Although animated, it's still a grounded family show. And uh, after running uh, King of the Hill for you know seven years, um, he goes on to create The Office. So he imports that sensibility to The Office for sure. Uh, Greg's storytelling method, he, he had a process that we, he would use. So in the pre-production, when you get the writers together before the show is going to be uh, produced, 
you, you get some lead up time. Six, eight weeks typically is, is how much time the writers have together before we're going to start shooting. And so this is when you really try to get a head start and come up with as many stories as you can uh, uh, to, to bankroll them going into the season. So Greg, to a degree that I have never seen a show writer do, a showrunner do, he would, he would force massive generation of story ideas. So what he would do is he would start, if we were the writing staff here, we would start in, a, in a, uh, the writer's room together just talking about the show, talking about life in general, and, uh, and every time a little um, spark of a story idea would, would come up, he would write it on a three by five card. Uh, Phyllis gets a laundry. Uh, would be one. That might be an idea for a story. Just coming out of conversation randomly. Do that for about two, maybe two and a half days. And then he would say, okay, all of you writers now want you to go off into your own office for a day or two and just come up with stories on your own without the influence of the rest of the staff. And then one by one the writers would come in and pitch to Greg uh, fully formed stories. They would typically uh, pitch I don't know, three or four well-beaten out stories and then six or eight notions for stories. All of these, again, go on three by five cards, a quick uh, three, four word description of what the story is. You have a staff of eight writers, you already have over a hundred ideas at least. And other little story ideas come up even in those pitch sessions. So uh, at the end of a week or two, you have so many of these three by five cards, you hardly know what to do. And what Greg would then do is just spread them all out over the floor and then try to organize them into A, B, and C stories and then also cold opens. And then those would all get pinned up to the wall and then you would see, I don't know, several hundred story ideas all pinned to the wall. And then as you would go through the season, uh, he would pick out stories that he thought, okay, this is the right one to do. Amazingly, even with that process of generating hundreds of stories in the pre-production, uh, he would typically use only a fraction of them by the end of the season, that it was new ideas yet would, would interest him and become the episodes. And then in addition, this is almost cruel, but is the level to which Greg would take it. Greg would endlessly re-break and throw out stories. So he would uh, green light you to write the story, go off, do an outline, I've read the outline, go off and do the draft, come back, do a table read, of the scripts, it's been punched up, the actors have come in, we do a table read, we have three days now before we're going to shoot it, and he would say, this is just the wrong story, this isn't the right story. And, and he would fundamentally either re-break it or throw it out and pull another card off the wall. It's just cruel, honestly, to do to writers because essentially we just feel our labor being wasted uh, over and over again. But he had the right to do it and it was part of his method. Personally, I think he overdid it. I think that um, Greg is so smart that he's constantly able to see some better idea, something new that's attracting him. And to some degree, you sacrifice quality in the writing because there just isn't enough time to write it well. And so everything comes becomes basically we're shooting a, a polished first draft. But that was his method. Greg had uh, a thing which I will share with you, and this is a document it's very holy to some people because it's so rare. This is Greg's script analysis checklist. So uh, the worst thing that could possibly happen to you as a writer would be that you would pitch a story, write a draft, and then Greg would sit you down and say, get out the script analysis checklist <laughs> and let's go over it because it means you'd fail in your homework somehow. But what's valuable about this is this will give you a direct insight into what uh, Greg was looking for in a story. Keep in mind, this is one of the greatest story creators ever these were the top things on his mind when he was reading your story. So I'll go through this with you. What is the story in a couple of lines? So he always wanted you to be able to just tell what basically the story uh, is. Um, and, and most good stories, you could tell the premise in a, in, in a sentence or two. Uh, I asked Paul Lieberstein the other day, what's, what's you know, one of your favorite stories? And he said, um, The Convict. This was a story which can be summed up in a couple of lines. It's, uh, they have an employee at the office temporarily who they discover uh, was once in prison and they all get interested in talking to him about his prison experience and he basically describes prison as being more appealing than this job because you don't have to do shitty work, you can go outside and exercise and you're allowed to sleep you know, in, your, in your, uh, cubicle if you want. 
And Michael Scott becomes so enraged that people think that his office is worse than prison that he decides to punish them by kind of locking them all in the conference room as if it were prison and give them a feeling for what prison is really like. He then goes uh, into this uh, uh, scared straight routine where he pretends to be uh, a prisoner called uh, Mad Mike or something and, and has a whole uh, set piece of performance there. But you can see that's, that story can easily be uh, recounted to you in a few sentences, and Greg really wanted that. Um, uh, what is the conflict, and how is the beginning grabby? He liked a, a, a premise that seemed a little original and, and got you interested at the start. Uh, this is a great question. He would say, uh, how will we know when the story is over? And that's a great question to ask yourself when you're creating a... Um, a narrative is you can create conflict between characters but you know if you have a football game you know when it's over the game is over when the clock runs out and you look at the score sports stories have nice clean endings but but how do you know when a story is over when it's a psychological battle between two characters he's pressing you to really find a concrete uh, goal uh, that can be defined and uh, and perceived by the audience what are the stakes and the escalations? Where, where are the turns? Uh, th that's classically asked by anyone who's making television. But Greg uh, puts here, uh, beware of rambly slice of life like Reno 911. So you know, Reno 911 is a show that he admired, but he felt the storytelling was weak because it was so completely improv that there was no uh, uh, structure uh, guiding you through it. Uh, are we saying something truthful if exaggerated about office life? So, uh, you know, even in a comedy, always, always, your best writers are going to be searching for some degree of meaning and message. That's a common denominator in all great uh, TV creators. Does it feel sitcom y and where? Okay, so good taste making comedy writers are always going to rebel against sitcom y. I think it's worth uh, identifying what we mean by sitcom. -y. Sitcom -y almost always means one thing, not real. So if you have a lot of coincidence, it's going to feel sitcom. -y. If people are saying things that they wouldn't really actually say because it's clever, that's sitcom. -y. It can be funny. Uh, it's generally a little more silly. So when you when you depart from reality, that's when you'll get accused of being sitcom. -y. Greg did not want it. There are many, many points here, but I'm just giving you a few of the top ones. Oh, this is a great uh, point he makes here. Are the situations starting from an ordinary place and growing bizarre slowly so you're carried away by a chain of logic? That, I think, is a really nice uh, uh, style element. You know, a lot of times on a television show, uh, people will pitch premises, and they're trying to uh, pitch a winner. They're trying to make you like it. They're trying to make you laugh. And so they'll pitch something big. Uh, you know, Michael Scott goes to a tanning salon and turns orange. That I heard pitched by somebody. It made people laugh when it, when it was pitched. But it's an example of really trying to go big at the start. Greg liked it much more if you started a little bit smaller and got bigger. And it's a, it's a great uh, method to import into your stories. Uh, small, real, observational. This was... That, that was a phrase that was constantly used at the office. It's a small, real, and observational. And so that gives you a cue to the tone he's looking for. But he said, even within that, can we have significant twists and turns of plot? And he points out that The Apartment, uh, a movie star Jack Lemmon, was small, observational, and relatable, but had significant uh, twists. Um, there's many others here, but uh, I'll just leave you with this one. He said, are the emotional beats, especially, too on the nose, or are they subtle and earned and poignant? Again, it's a small point, but uh, is really the difference between a show that gets an Emmy and a show that doesn't. Uh, J uh, Greg's always looking for emotion, but he's comfortable with it being subtle and not too on the nose. The demise of the sitcom in the late 80s and early 90s was really, in great part, the emotion was fake and too on the nose. There was something called the heart scene, which cropped up into all of uh, television comedy uh, by the late 80s, early 90s. The heart scene was the scene in which the theme, the emotional theme is delivered, typically by the dad to the teenage daughter sitting on the edge of the bed when he says to her, just be yourself. <laughs> and so that's an example of what he's trying to get away, with, get away from, still keep the emotion, but make sure it's not too on the nose. 
All right, so uh, this is the Greg Daniels uh, story checklist. Feel free to take a look at it afterwards if you want. All right, so when I came into this show, it already existed, and I was brought in as a writer and had to learn uh, the show um, and, and you know become a writer for the show. Uh, I managed to pick up the style of writing on the show by the second episode. The first one I really struggled with, and, but the second one I managed to hit it. I want to share with you this story because it was the second one I wrote and was always considered the best one I ever wrote. And uh, I think if you, if you deconstruct it slightly, you can see why it was well received. All right, so this episode was called Business School, uh, and there are three stories in it. There's, um, there's a, just a straight comedy C story, just played for comedy, uh, about a bat being discovered in the office. Uh, and this was based on a real observation. Somebody who had worked in Pennsylvania said that from time to time a bat would get caught in the uh, ceiling and uh, it would come out and fly around the office and it would be kind of horrible for the people who worked there. <laughs> so we thought, okay, it's real, it's observational, that passes uh, Greg's test. And so the, the story there is just that uh, Dwight is the authority in the office Michael has left for the day. <laughs> Uh, he finds uh, animal droppings, he discovers a bat, he's very excited, this is exactly what he loves, to you know, trap animals. But it gets out, flies around the office, causes a disaster, uh, and eventually he has to trap it in the, uh, in the uh, break room in a, in a big physical scene where it's caught in Meredith's hair and Dwight puts a bag over her head and you can see the bat, the bat flapping in the, in the sack. It was a big uh, visual ending. Um, and then includes within it uh, Jim uh, John Krasinski pretending that he's been bit by the bat and is slowly turning into a vampire. Uh, and so he's, he's tricking Dwight into this in a, in a fairly subtle way. Uh, but now this is a great example of starting with something small and believable and real and observational and animal in the office and then going fairly big with pretending to be turning into a vampire. Note that it's just played for comedy and is a great balance to the A and B stories which are significantly emotional stories. All right, so the A and B story and the way they work together is actually what made this uh, a valuable episode. The A story is Michael Scott is being brought to business school by his young protege Ryan, played by B.J. Novak. Michael loves Ryan and thinks of him as his mentee and, and, uh, and really believes that Ryan kind of uh, follows in his footsteps. Ryan has invited him to come lecture at uh, business school where Ryan is taking classes. Michael is extremely uh, uh, proud and ennobled by this and can't wait to teach these young people everything he knows about business. He gets a big set piece where he gives a completely incoherent and ridiculous speech to them about uh, how to run a business uh, and pure Steve Carell comedy. And then uh, uh, Michael Scott discovers that in fact Ryan has brought him here as an example of a failing and doomed business. A paper company in a world that is becoming increasingly paperless uh, is a doomed business that will be dead in, in eight years according to Ryan. And Michael is devastated by this when he realizes that his protege doesn't believe in him and really brought him up there as an example of a failure, he's heartbroken. So it, it climaxes in a really down emotion for Michael Scott. The B story is Pam has an art show for the first time. Pam is a secretary who aspires to be an artist and now a big moment for her. She's uh, going to show some of her paintings with some other local artists at a, at a little uh, impromptu gallery and she invites everyone in the office, shows them the flyers, is very excited, but when she goes there almost nobody comes to see her and then the two people who do come Oscar and his boyfriend, who's a very sort of uh, erudite and uh, sharp-tongued guy, they come and Pam overhears the boyfriend uh, criticizing her art. Uh, she has a painting, a watercolor painting of the uh, office itself, the office building, and, uh, and, and this character Gil uh, says, oh god, this, this terrible uh, motel art. And Pam overhears this and she realizes that She's not the artist she really thinks she is. Probably what was going to be her big debut is a heartbreaking failure. So in both the A and the B stories, we have a climax and a real emotional downer for both of them. So far, so good. It's, it's emotional. Uh, the ending is really what sold it. So the ending is Michael Scott leaves this devastating uh, lecture that he gave at the business school and goes and tries to hurry to make it to Pam's art show that he promised he would go to. He's in a very heartbroken down mood. 
he comes and sees Pam's paintings, uh, and he sees the, the watercolor that she did of the office building. A very generic, nothing watercolor. It is not a great piece of art, quite deliberately. Uh, and he loves it. He can't believe it. He's so moved by it. He says, oh, Pam, you did it. You just, you captured it. And he's, he offers to buy it, and he pays her for the painting, and she sold the painting. And so in her moment of, uh, of lowest uh, devastation, she's buoyed up by his uh, overwhelming enthusiasm for the painting. It, it ha it sh and she hugs him and gets tears in her eyes. And it's a, it's a, a lovely moment because ultimately it's, it's a very nuanced victory for her. She knows that Michael is a buffoon who doesn't have great taste in art. It doesn't convince her that she's a great artist by any means. But it is emotionally healing to her in a moment that she needs it, and so it works emotionally. What is so significant, I think, about this end ending is that in the process of breaking the story, I 100% fought Greg on the ending. I, I said, I don't think the ending works, Greg. It, she had a need which isn't fulfilled. Her need is to be recognized as somebody valuable and successful, and she knows that Michael doesn't represent uh, cr critical taste. And so logically, uh, it, it hasn't satisfied her need. What Greg said was, it, it doesn't matter. He said, it's like if you had a bad day and the dog came and curled up on your lap. It doesn't solve your problems in the long term, but it does solve them emotionally in this moment uh, enough to give you an ending, and it just proves how right he was, and it proves again how if your if your ending is emotionally correct, it doesn't matter if it's logically a little off. So that was a great lesson of uh, of that episode. Uh, the I was at the office for seven seasons. Uh, I think wrapping up the office uh, segment here, I think one thing that's really worth looking at if you ever look at that show is what happens when the lead leaves the show. So typically a show is its central character, right? That's what makes it a hit or not. Steve Carell left this office in season seven. It still went on another three seasons. And if you, if you watch the way that show was reinvented, there are a lot of very interesting lessons about television making. There was first a search for a new lead, which was quite uh, equivocal. Several people were put in the boss position. Some of it was political. Rain Wilson felt he was the heir to the show and was destined to be the star. The network wanted to put Ed Helms in because Ed Helms had become a movie star in the process, and so they thought, put the bigger guy in. Because Rain, who had been there longer, was not made the boss of the office, they gave him his own pilot, which was called The Farm, basically as a compensation, saying, you're not the head of the office, but we'll give you your own show. That pilot was shot, but never picked up, and was aired as something like episode 18 of season 9. It's just one of the strangest things ever in TV for me, is that you get to an episode which contains none of the office regulars. It's just Dwight inherits a farm and meets all these other characters, including the star of Silicon Valley, uh, Thomas Middlebanch, who was the star of The Farm, along with, with Dwight. Uh, and I thought when this thing airs, the audience will just rebel. They'll just go, what are you doing? This isn't The Office. Nobody seemed to notice. <laughs> uh, another great lesson there. All right, that's your basic uh, primer on The Office. Uh, you know, I ran the show in season nine along with Greg and, and got to try to exercise my ideas of how a show should be run properly. If you saw my show running lecture, you know my basic uh, uh, insights there. I felt that all television had been run very poorly until I was allowed to do it in season nine of The Office and tried to massively increase the efficiency um, uh, largely by empowering the writers to start the process earlier than they had been allowed to start it before. Writers typically are not assigned their story until the last minute. It's a little bit of a control over writers. You know, we, maybe if you work better, I'll assign you a story later, right? Cool. It's a disaster, in my opinion. I want to assign you a story as early as possible, so you're thinking about it early, so that you deliver a kick-ass episode. There's no point in, in waiting longer. And then, uh, you know, I have my four-week method, which which I developed in the last season of The Office. I came out of there now with showrunner uh, credentials, uh, and and did one season. Uh, with uh, one of my colleagues here on a show called Super Fun Night, where I was the head writer. Uh, I can kind of skip over that one, although I think there, there, there are some funny lessons to be learned there. Super Fun Night was a show on ABC that was uh, starred Rebel Wilson, 
as a star. Rebel is an incredibly talented performer, very, very uh, strong comic performer, I think. Um, but was also the creator of the show and the head writer of the show in a sense. She was the final word and would rewrite scripts at home. She's not a trained writer, and I think that uh, she's a good writer, but not trained in writing network TV. And I think that essentially what happened was you had a star with too much power to rewrite the episodes and a misunderstanding really of what the network was looking for. And some of that misunderstanding was hilarious. Rebel is an Australian woman with a very bawdy sense of humor and she just couldn't understand that you couldn't say fuck on ABC. <laughs> and we would say to her, Rebel, you can't say fuck. And she would say, I think you can. <laughs> you really, really can't. Well, we've got to try. Like, we don't we really need to try because we know that we can't. They do it on HBO. But that's cable, right? I don't know. I think we should try. Do you remember, do you remember when she had the idea that for a funny scene would be for her to get her pants to come down a little bit and she'd be wearing a pubic wig which would appear on camera. And we said, Rebel, this is ABC, okay? This is the Disney funded show that people are watching with their kids. You cannot show a pubic wig. And she said, I think you can. I think we've got to try. And it shows you the star power that a person can have. We shot that fucking scene. We shot it just because we couldn't argue her out of it. And then, of course, in editing, it strangely got cut. So, uh, so that, that one went, what? What did we do? 13 on that? Uh, 17. 17, okay, yes. Yeah, the, the odd... first ever back four. The back four. If you ever get the back four, uh, start making your summer vacation plans. Uh -huh. <laughs> no one ever comes back from the back four. Uh, you know, so inter an interesting process, certainly. Uh, you know, another, I think, great lesson from that show is um, when you are launching a television show, until you experience this, you, you wouldn't know it, but what happens is there's tremendous pressure on the first four episodes. The conventional wisdom is that a show settles into its ratings pattern in the first four episodes. And so you launch, generally with inflated ratings because you've promoted the shit out of your show, and you start to drop, and then the question is how far do you drop? And by four, you've kind of settled into a pattern. And because everyone is desperately watching those ratings in the first four weeks, there's a pressure to just pull out all the stops in those first four episodes. You know, get the characters uh, have a flirtation. Well, they should sleep together. Uh, they should get engaged. They should you, crazy shit should happen. And so you, you'll see that a really artificial desperation creeps into the storytelling of network television shows, in this uh, uh, craving for for. Uh, poppy ratings early on. And it's really a mistake, I think, from the perspective of the viewer. It is also something that when you go to a show like Netflix, you escape that entirely because there are no ratings on a network show in that sense. You release the, all 10 episodes of season one you know, on one day and then they're watched when they're watched. So there is no watching of ratings. It allows you to do a much more rational storytelling process. And let that be the uh, transition into uh, lessons of Apatow here. Uh, this will be shorter than lessons of, uh, of office, um, uh, but, I, but I think, uh, you know, the lessons of working with Judd Apatow are as significant as any I've ever had um, to this day. Judd, for those of you who, who uh, don't know Judd's biography, uh, it's, it's really quite a remarkable story. Judd was a kid in Long Island. Um, whose parents were not in the show business at all. Uh, his mom didn't work. His dad, I think, um, uh, had, had various jobs. Uh, was a record producer at some point, but was always sort of economically a little bit on the edge. Judd was a lonely kid growing up, and he discovered comedy early on. He, would, he basically had no friends and was a latchkey kid, and so he would sit and watch six hours of television a day, typically the talk shows. Merv Griffin was his obsession. And, uh, and so the comedians on the talk shows were, uh, were fascinating to, to Judd, and he, he really fell for comedy at an early age. So he has this very powerful personal connection to comedy. When he had no friends, he felt that the comedians were really connecting with him, and it stuck with him his, ento his entire life. He, to this day, his connection to comedy is, is as visceral as, as anyone's I've ever met. Early on, in high school, uh, he discovered that his high school had a radio uh, station. They were broadcasting to some small number of people, but it was kind of a, a, a project you could be involved in with, with your high school. 
he had a friend that had discovered like, hey, if you if you have a radio station, you can go and call like the managers of rock stars and interview them because the rock stars don't know. You say I'm on a radio station and you get to talk to these rock stars. Uh -huh. So Judd said, I'm going to do that, but with comedians. And so he started a radio station, a uh, radio program, and he would call all the biggest comedy managers in on the East Coast and say, I'm Judd Apatow, I'm, I'm from KCLJ, or whatever they were called, and I'd like to do an interview with your client, Jerry Seinfeld. And the next thing he knows, he's, he's sitting there with Jerry Seinfeld. He did this with Jay Leno, with all of these guys who were the, you know, the top comedians of his day. And he said... In every single case, there would be this moment where he would show up at Jerry Seinfeld's apartment. You know, Seinfeld would open the door and see this 15-year-old kid with a giant tape recorder. <laughs> and then you would see the comedian would just go, oh, fuck, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some fucking kid. Okay. And then, because the comedians were very nice, they would grant him a long interview, and he would ask everything that he wanted to know about comedy, how you made comedy, how you become a stand-up comedian. And so this was really his early education. He collected all these interviews, by the way, in a book called Sick in the Head that just came out. They're great. He still has the interviews. So he had this early comedy training. Uh, he, he got into UCLA, went for one uh, year, and then his parents went bankrupt and could not afford college. And there was no discussion uh, about how to possibly finance further years. They just said, sorry, Judd, we did our best. You got a year of college. Good luck. And so he dropped out of college. He was, at this point, working a little bit as a stand-up comedian. He was never a very successful stand-up comedian, which was his great goal. But what he found was he was able to write jokes for other people. So he was writing jokes for Larry, uh, for Gary Shandling, uh, Roseanne Barr, discovered him as a joke writer. And he was able to write for these people. Uh, they hired him as a writer for um, Comic Relief. He did that for a few years. They made him a producer at Comic Relief. Suddenly he's a 24-year-old producer, guy with producer titles. And Judd, uh, another trait you really can import and help your career is if you can somehow get massive chutzpah, where you'll just walk in someplace as a 24-year-old and go, yeah, I'm a producer, I can do your show for sure. Judd had that. He had a crazy... Um, whether it was fake confidence or not, no one ever knew, but he would definitely put himself out there and claim to be able to do stuff. And so at 24, he ran into a young performer named Ben Stiller. Ben said, I have a deal at Fox to do a show. Judd said, I'm a comedy producer. They said, let's get together, and they put on the Ben Stiller show, and Judd's career as a, as a writer-producer took off. It's, it's worth noting that Judd's early career was a string of pretty big Flops. I mean, he did a number of movies. He did something called Celtic Pride. Anybody ever heard of that? Totally flop. Uh, heavyweights about a fat camp. Complete <laughs> flop. Then they let him uh, produce a giant budget movie called Cable Guy, which nearly uh, bankrupted a studio. So he had a series of just high-profile disasters, but continued on the basis of his ambition and talent to get more and more jobs. Uh, you know, breakthroughs for him were Freaks and Geeks, Again, a failed show. That show was canceled, but now he had uh, big critical credentials from Freaks and Geeks. Everybody loved it as a show. He got a pilot deal to make pilots, and he made a number of pilots which never aired, but may be uh, findable by you guys. North Hollywood was one that I really liked that he did. Just a pilot. Never went anywhere. Uh, and it was about four actors living in on the margins of the real Hollywood industry. They're trying to become actors, so North Hollywood sort of indicates uh, not real Hollywood, but just beyond, right? And uh, so look how incredibly astute Judd is with casting. He cast four total unknowns in this show for the actors. Amy Poehler, Jason Segel, Kevin Hart, January Jones. None of them had ever been on screen really before. A Amy Poehler was getting a little bit of, uh, of, of celebrity as a, as a stage performer, but for the most part, January Jones had never been on film before. Judd discovered January Jones. She owes her entire career to Judd. And Siegel, you know, largely the same. Kevin Hart, complete unknown. Uh, it, it, a side story, but this one I, I think should amuse you. He did a table read of this pilot, uh, North Hollywood. It was a fucking great table read. It was wall-to-wall -wall laughs. They just crushed it. Uh, afterwards, they got notes from uh, ABC, and the notes were so downcast and demoralizing, and, and, uh, and Judd went from feeling ecstatic about his show to you could see uh, he was about to blow a gasket because he was so pounded down by the executives. He had brought a young Brent Forrester to this meeting uh, just as a, a writing consultant of his, and in one of those moments, which I don't do anymore, 
Um, <laughs> I, I, I pulled a great Forrester sort of stunt, which was, uh, I, I, everyone had talked, everyone had made at least two comments, I hadn't said anything. So finally I said, look, my name is Brent Forrester, I've been hired by Judge Helton with the writing. Um, I just want you to know, I had uh, an odd premonition on the drive over here. I was driving on those winding canyon roads and I had a premonition that I would die in a car crash on the drive home. And if I do die in a car crash on the drive home, what I say next will be remembered by all of you for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those moments where you just have everybody's attention, you know. It's just bizarre. I had stood up by this point. I remember looking down at Judd, and he was just looking at me, just like laughing, like, what are you doing? And, uh, and so I said, uh, I said, those actors are stars, and this man is a genius. And now goodbye, and I just made my exit. And then because, because Judd was my ride, I couldn't really leave. I, I had to hide behind a bush for a while until the meeting broke up, and Judd came out and looked around, and then I snuck out behind the bush and got in the car and went home. Uh, so the point uh, really is that Judd was out there creating stuff and developing, actually, the Judd Apatow filmmaking style by shooting TV pilots, many of which never aired. And, uh, and then he suddenly broke with The 40-Year-Old Virgin, which he wrote and directed. Uh, and, uh, and then he really went off to the races and had this incredible string of hits in the movies. Um, you know, he produced Anchorman, Bridesmaids, Talladega Nights, Superbad, Pineapple Express. Um, he wrote uh, uh, Knocked Up um, and, you know, and, just countless hit films. No one has ever had a streak of successes like Judd since, uh, before or since. Uh, and so, you know, the final chapter in my biography is reuniting with Judd. Uh, he sold a show to Netflix last season called Love and brought me in to be the showrunner. All right, so let me just briefly give you the lessons of this last season uh, in a nutshell. Okay, uh, question one. Why did Judd decide to do this show Love? What is it about this show that made this guy say, I'm going to go into television and make this show. It's two things principally. One of them is very, actually really both core Judd Apatow things. One of them is uh, the show is based on a performer that Judd believes in. So there's a young guy named Paul Rust who is, a, how to describe Paul, he's kind of a, a beaky nosed guy with glasses. Paul says to me that when he walks down the street in, in uh, New York, he says, uh, for some reason in New York, uh, of all places, people will just say to him, hey, nerd! Like, uh, like in, in places in the country where there's a little less restraint, uh, they just identify him as looking very nerdy. He's like the stereotypical nerd-looking guy. Uh, he's a very talented performer with a, with a great look. He's, you know, he's really in the Rick Moranis tradition of performers. And the idea, you, you can imagine taking Rick Moranis and making him, do you know who I'm talking about, the guy in Ghostbusters and nerdy guy? Uh, if you made Rick Moranis the center of a romantic comedy, that's kind of an original fun thing to do. So, so it, it starts with the performer. Judd's instincts for performers are second to none, I think. And then uh, there, is a, there is an emotional truth to the concept itself. So this, this project came from Paul Rust and his, and his girlfriend, uh, wrote a screenplay about their own relationship. So Paul himself is a people-pleasing Catholic guy from Iowa. He is simply the nicest, easiest to get along with guy in the world. And just people-pleasing. Wants everyone to be happy. Is kind of distressed if anybody else is stressed. He got together with a girl who's a, a former heroin addict, uh, uh, chaotic, erratic, emotionally dysregulated. Uh, so it's, it's an incredibly stable guy with an incredibly unstable uh, girlfriend. And they wrote very honestly about their relationship in their, in their screenplay. The emotional honesty is what grabs Judd every time. That really is the thing which, if you go to pitch to Judd tomorrow, pitch him the true story of your life, warts and all. The worst, uh, in quotes, stuff you've ever done is what he wants to hear. The most transgressive you've ever been, um, if you've done crimes, pitch him that uh, directly. Uh, in, in great detail. He's a guy who is looking for comedy um, in, in marginal behavior. And one of the first lessons that I really learned from him this season was coming out of a network show where we must be restrained, we can't use the F word despite Rebel Wilson's uh, desire, 
Judd wants you to go the other way. He, he wants you really to write as filthy as you can. The behavior should be as irresponsible as you can make it. And what he feels is if you push in that direction, you can pull back. So if, it become, if the characters become repugnant to you, you can always pull back, but you've gotten into territory that is original, interesting, and ultimately is funnier than you would think at first. I, I feel coming from network, a lot of us writers feel like, ooh, the character won't be likable if he or she lies this much. Or, uh, or does drugs and drives. You know, things where you think that's irresponsible behavior will make the character unlikable. Judd is not anywhere near as concerned with that likability factor. Another thing you get from network executives all the time, likability. Apatow's not concerned. He feels you cast likable actors, it'll be likable, but give me behavior which is true, and especially true from flawed characters. Uh, the biggest lesson we learned in the writing of the show early on was we ran, we basically really blew it uh, from Judd's perspective in the first few scripts that we wrote. And it's my fault. I was the head writer, showrunner, leading these writers along. Talented, clever writers. Writing funny dialogue. Funny dialogue between the characters. How can we go wrong? We'll imp impress Judd Shirley with this funny dialogue. Judd said, uh, I hate the dialogue. I hate the style of the dialogue. I hate that it is banter. I don't want banter. And so he coined this phrase which we've been using. For those of you writing things down, this is a great phrase to have in your little notebook. Behavior over banter. Behavioral comedy is what Judd wants over banter. What is behavioral comedy? Well, Judd kept pointing us to Larry Sanders as an example of behavioral comedy. Behavioral comedy is the little things people are doing more than the things they're saying. So for example, um, Hiding your true motives is something you see a lot in the Larry Sanders show. Uh, Hank is a great uh, behavioral comic character. He's frequently coming in with little agendas. Uh, he's, he's hiding what his true motive is. All of those little hidings and, and uh, moves and counter moves between characters <coughs> fall into the category of behavioral comedy. And for the sophisticated comedy viewer, I would put it right up there with naturalism as part of the style that your taste-making comedy uh, creators and viewers are looking for. Um, take a look here at my other lessons of Apatow. You know, his casting is remarkable. I think if, when you guys watch the show, and uh, I think it drops in March 2016, uh, again, you will see a cast of, of actors virtually uh, never seen by you before, um, six of which are huge stars in the making. So just the way Seth Rogen was nobody and now is huge, you will see multiples of this. And it, I don't know quite how Judd does it. Part of it is that he has Allison Jones, a great casting director, but, you know, show of hands, who's heard of Claudia O'Doherty? She'll be a fucking household name uh -huh. uh, in five years. She's that good. A tremendous comic performer from... Australia, who's also a profoundly talented actor. Uh, Brett Gelman, anybody? A little bit more well-known, basically unknown to the, to, to the comedy world. Incredible performer. Chris Witoski wasn't even known to the comedy world. He's just like nine people in Chicago have heard of Chris Witoski. The guy's incredible. So the casting process really was, uh, was, was vindicated uh, nicely, I think. The, um, the other things that we, that we really did on this show, which have been eye-opening for me, and I really want you to embrace as writers and comedy creators, pace. The pace of a show that Apatow wants to do is so different from Network, and it's slower. This goes against everything that I felt I was supposed to learn in doing Network comedy. When I came into comedy, I worked at a uh, studio called Witt Thomas Harris, and Paul Witt, the uh, executive producer of all the shows, uh, had crocheted on a uh, fr frame crochet on his wall that said pacing and energy. And he had said these notes so many times, somebody crocheted it and he had it framed. And, mm -hmm. and it was considered a truism of comedy. Pace it up quicker, quicker, right? Energy, faster, faster. And, and it is true that frequently when you're doing comedy, you want to cut it and make it faster. But it's, it is in some ways, uh, a false guide and has led us astray in comedy because what happens is when stuff gets faster the thing that you really lose is emotion and grounded performance and you can actually see it when you're on set I saw it many times this season directors would come in to our show and they're trained comedy directors and they'd be directing the actors and they'd say you know pace it up here a little bit 
and then you would see the actress pace it up, and then between takes, one of our actresses, Gillian Jacobs, under the spell of a director like this, she walked off set and she was pacing and she looked concerned. I said, what's wrong, Gillian? And she goes, oh, I just feel like a very bad actor right now. And it was because of the pacing. When pushed to go faster, it's difficult for actors to deliver more grounded performances. And so stuff begins to feel a little more superficial and a little more silly. So even in the performance, slowing down can be very valuable, very counterintuitive. But the storytelling itself is where we really slowed it down. Just to give you an example here of the storytelling without spoiling too much. The pilot uh, follows two couples, a guy and a girl who will become the leads of the show, both in relationships. Guy has a girlfriend, girl has a boyfriend, and the pilot episode is, is these two separately uh, in their relationships having horrible breakups, painful, catastrophic breakups. That's the pilot, and in the last scene, those two characters happen to walk into a 7-Eleven, and the guy and the girl run to each other in a 7-Eleven, and they say hi to each other. And that's it. That's the whole encounter of, of the two that will be the leads. And it feels very bold when you read it. It feels original and fun. You know these two are meant to be together. The show's called Love. And you know that these are the two that are going to fall in love. But the fact that, it's, that you get so much backstory for them uh, is, is very satisfying and original and makes you very interested when they finally meet. Episode 2, we pick them up right where they met in the 7-Eleven. They're just like the same scene, literally just continuing the dialogue directly. They talk. He, she didn't have money to buy her coffee. He bought her coffee. She says, thanks. I can pay you back. I don't, I don't live too far from here. Why don't we walk? And so they just walk. And then there's you know a real-time walk, a really long walk, like 11 minutes of just walking and talking with no plot at all. And a lot of times they're walking and they just stop talking. They don't have anything to say. It's the stuff that would just be cut immediately from any network show. There's no way when you're fighting for ratings in, in your first four episodes, you're going to let characters walk along and not saying anything. The network would fire you instantly. And yet, when you see it on screen, it's really satisfying. It feels so correct, and, and it, it deepens everything. Episode three, the two characters are at work, and we follow her at work, and we follow him at work, and they don't speak to each other at all. They send a couple of texts, and that's it. When Judd said that we were going to do that, I was I sweated, I lost sleep. I was like, we can't do it. The audience will turn on us. There's no, they can't. And I was so wrong. He was so right. And so, uh, so pacing has really been one of the great lessons of this show that I think will make the show stand out. Um, you know, the, the other uh, the other big lesson I think from from this show is the way the show is shot is an attempt at an evolution in the way television is made. So, you know, you have uh, traditionally shot shows where you get your master and your coverage and you're turning the camera around. You have The Office, which is shooting two cameras simultaneously. You have Judd Apatow movies in which you're basically shooting cross coverage and having a shitload of impro improvisation, a ton of improvisation. Uh, and Judd wants to do a TV show in that same heavy improvisation way. The problem is, in television, we just don't have enough time. We're shooting an entire show in five days. Judd shooting a show, a movie in, in you know, 60 days, uh, 40 days, 50 days, right? He has so much more time to get improv, we just don't have it. So the question is, can you create a shooting pattern which is quick, like a network TV show, but allows for enough cross coverage that you get improv? And that's basically what we're trying to do. So it's, it's a combo. We try to shoot uh, quickly, get pretty master shots, and then go quickly into coverage and get our, our improv and coverage. So when you watch the show, see if it looks like uh, an HBO show or a Netflix show in terms of the quality.